um, as I said on the panel, um, uh, our vision for the, the Zcash Foundation is to sort of take, gradually have a handoff of the responsibility for the bulk of the development of this public good to a nonprofit, because nonprofits are, you know, sensible uh, loci for the development of public goods. Because when uh, a, a for-profit company develops public good, we always have to ask ourselves, are the incentives aligned? Are they aligned long-term? And I actually think in the case of Zcash, they are, it's my personal opinion, um, in large part because I trust the people at the, at, the, at the company and also because of the structure of the mining reward. Uh, it expired, the, the reward going to the company, um, the percentage of the reward going to the company expiring after four years and this handoff taking place. Um, but we can talk about that uh, offline if you're interested. Um, we were, where were we? Here we were, at the cliffhanger. So um, what makes the Bank Secrecy Act constitutional? And Katie's talk was perfect to, to intercede here because it's a great uh, real world story and a fascinating one of what all, a lot of the information collected under the BSA is used for. Um, it's not just data on the blockchain that led to the um, arrest of persons who were, were corrupt in the US government. It also, at the end of the day, in some cases, was information collected by regulated financial institutions and the com comparison of that data with blockchain data. Um, but all of this bulk collection of data raises the question, just like as it raises the question in the email um, context or the private messaging context or any internet context in general, is this uh, really still constitutional in the US under the Fourth Amendment or is this an impermissible collection of data without a warrant that we would um, prefer not happen? Uh, what does this do to our privacy online? Um, is there not a prohibition on warrantless search? But I'm going to actually leave you <laughs> with a little bit more of that cliffhanger because I want to briefly explain, uh, for those of you who don't know what Coin Center does, what we do and, 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 and why I'm here and, and why I've accumulated all of this interesting ephemera on regulation and cryptocurrency. Um, so Coin Center is based in Washington, D.C. We're a nonprofit research and advocacy center uh, with a, a, a fairly simple mission. We want to do our part from the legal and regulatory side to help decentralize all the things. Um, I mean, maybe not all the things, but certain things that society relies on, I think, would be best provided by networks that are decentralized, where power isn't accumulated within large centralized institutions, uh, both for privacy purposes, for censorship-resistant purposes, by, by that I mean free speech purposes, things like that. And these technologies really are amazing in their ability to finally start uh, offering a glimpse of what that might look like. What does money look like if it's not something that's created by centralized institutions like governments or um, uh, banks and big corporations? Now, we have a full-time professional staff. We have three attorneys on staff. Uh, Jerry Brito is our, our uh, executive director and sort of the founder of Coin Center. He was previously at the George Mason uh, Mercatus Center, uh, more of an academic, when he was eventually convinced to leave his more academic position to go off and focus exclusively on his legal research into cryptocurrency by a number of persons in the space who wanted sort of an adult voice in Washington, D.C. to represent these open blockchain networks, these open technologies like Bitcoin. Um, we have, uh, we're a nonprofit, so we take donations. Um, we're not a trade association is one thing I wanted to point out. So it's not as if we have a number of companies that are members and get to, to push our agenda. We're independent. We're like a think tank um, between our, our staff and our board of advisors and our board of directors. We sort of pick our agenda. And in, in general, it's to support decentralization um, and cryptocurrencies and good policies surrounding cryptocurrencies that will allow them to flourish. Uh, but we do take donations from anybody who then recognizes our mission as something that they like and might benefit them and might benefit the technologies they believe in. And it's a whole list of companies in this space. A lot of them are Bitcoin companies because our early work was primarily Bitcoin, primarily because if you had someone in government asking you about cryptocurrency, it was always Bitcoin first. Um, but increasingly, uh, a, a number of other technologies as well, like Zcash, Ethereum Foundation are supporters as well. And what we do in Washington, D.C. is uh, basically boils down to three things. Um, it's education, it's policy research, and it's advocacy. And education is fairly self-explanatory. 
when someone in the Department of Treasury, in the policy division maybe, or maybe in enforcement somewhere, or somebody in um, Congress, a staffer, or maybe even a member of the House or the Senate, wants an explanation. They want to understand what is this Bitcoin thing. Um, when Katie said that in 2012 she was asked to you know, bring an enforcement action against Bitcoin, it's, I think it's a shame that Coinbase wasn't around then. We started in uh, 2000, late 2013 because we would have hopefully been a good resource to help her. I'm sure you understood fairly quickly after looking at the Wikipedia article, but another resource to help you understand, like, look, it's a network. Uh, you, you, it's not a corporation. It's not like eGold or Liberty Reserve. So when somebody in government has these questions, we want to provide honest answers that also don't paint the technology in an unfairly negative light, because many people's first exposure in government to these technologies is because someone in my congressional district got ransomware, and they have to make these payments in Bitcoin. What the heck is this Bitcoin thing, and what is it doing, and how can I stop it? Because uh, they associate with the ransomware. So we um, describe the technology quite earnestly, I believe, and also describe quite earnestly what we see the long-term benefits of the technology being as far as freedom, well-being, economic uh, well-being, uh, faster transactions, all sorts of things, scalability, et cetera. Um, and then in our talks about how the technology works to help people understand. Sometimes we get more specific into things like payment channel protocols and things like that, newer aspects of the technology because there are new questions arising there. And sometimes there are uh, questions to which we don't have answers. And we don't have answers not because it's a question of the technology and we either don't know or can't find somebody in the space to explain it, um, but rather because it's a question about how the law applies to the technology. And it's a question where the technology and its capabilities have outpaced what the law normally uh, understood as you know, regulatable activities or activities that should be regulated. And what, what is in between them now is this gap or gray area of uncertainty where there's this open question. How does the, the law apply to that? Uh, the gentleman uh, from up there asked earlier, what about uh, a node in the Lightning Network or a payment channel or something like that? Um, are they a BSA regulated entity? I mean, do they fit into that regulatory structure? Are they an MSB? That is a gray area. And so what we do at that point, where we realize there's this gap or this area of uncertainty emerging, is the policy research. And this is mostly legal research and legal reasoning and also reasoning about um, public policy and constitutional issues. And we will usually write reports or things like this. Um, we'll take meetings, one-to-one -one meetings, one-to-many meetings, and discuss our thoughts on this issue and usually have a prescriptive policy at the end where we say, look, there's many ways forward here. There's probably many ways to enforce the law or not enforce the law or do it this way or that way. But this is the way that we think you'll still, as a regulator, be able to achieve your statutory mandate, what Congress sent you there to do without unduly crushing innovation in this space, without making it impossible for people, at least Americans, but given that our laws apply extraterritorially, um, maybe anybody, that still allows people to um, you know, develop the technology, build, innovation, in a, build new innovative businesses, and all these sorts of things. And then we basically go and we advocate for those policy solutions as against the possible policy options which would result in, uh, you know, uh, undue uh, suppression of innovation in the space. And we love open blockchain networks. So a lot of people say like, okay, so what's your constituency? Uh, what, what are the groups of technologies that you believe in and that you advocate for? Um, we don't discriminate. I know I've been prejudicial here and put three of some of my personal interests up here. But generally, uh, the way we kind of identify the group of technologies that we want to uh, do our best to, to clear the path for on the regulatory side, it's, it's anything with an open consensus mechanism. So anything where a person using nothing but an uh, internet-connected computer and free and open source software can then partake actually in the, in the consensus mechanism, maybe as a very minor player if the proof of work uh, difficulty is very high or if the staking uh, difficulty is or the staking amount is large but at least it's an open source network and it's an open consensus model that in theory anyone could join it's not some sort of fully identified permissioned consensus where you have to be one of the big 50 banks to participate I've got nothing against 
permissioned uh, blockchain technologies, that's just not within our core competency. Um, we want to represent public networks um, because public networks don't have a single face. Um, a permissioned blockchain company can probably do their own lobbying, as can the, the banks and financial institutions that might join them. So that's what we take as our constituency. Um, how many people in the room know the Electronic Frontier Foundation? That's awesome. I love it when there's a room like that, because it's not always like that. Um, I've always said that the, um, the people who work at the EFF are my heroes. They were my heroes when I decided to go to law school. They're my heroes to this day. Um, I think if Coin Center is doing the work that we want it to do, we will be serving a more specialized role that's nonetheless very similar to what the EFF did and continues to do for the internet. Um, basically a place for uh, educational resources, but also advocacy in favor of an open technology, in favor of the rights of users and developers who are unaffiliated but making this public resource better. We want to do that, what the EFF did for the internet, for open blockchain networks, because we believe it's important. And the EFF, gosh, they have a lot on their plate with the Snowden revelations and other things, and so if they need a little uh, support on the cryptocurrency side, which has a whole lot of new financial regulations involved in it, we're happy to, to join the team, hopefully. So, back to the cliffhanger. Um, what's the constitutionality of the BSA? How does this all work? And uh, if we move to a world where we didn't have these lumpy financial institutions, how would this all work? Um, in the old days, this was a lot simpler. Um, and the old days, I mean before, say, the 1970s. Uh, because most transactions back then, and even beyond then, up until the 80s and 90s, were done using cash, using a physical bearer instrument, as opposed to an electronic bearer instrument like Bitcoin or Zcash. Um, and to the extent there were records kept about these transactions, these records, because Bitcoin itself has no, I mean, uh, Bitcoin itself, cash itself has no ledger, you know, there's no information created on a, a spreadsheet somewhere when I hand someone a $100 bill. To the extent there are any records in this world, they're records kept by the individual persons involved in the transaction. And you might say, like, who really keeps that many records for cash? But actually, people do, especially if they're, say, the merchant accepting payment, and they have a business to run, and they have, uh, you know, tax liabilities to worry about, or an individual who wants to voluntarily comply with the tax code. And in the US and in most other developed nations, we have voluntary compliance with the tax code. We rely on people to honestly report their taxes. Yes, there's tax evasion, but that's still the basic structure. We don't build massive surveillance apparatus to force people to pay their taxes. We assume that they will do it voluntarily first and then see if we can catch them evading those controls. So you keep records if you're an honest citizen. Additionally, an employer is gonna keep records if they've got employees. They have to do payroll. So this is how it used to be in the world of bearer instruments. And what that meant was if law enforcement, and you know, FinCEN didn't even exist back in this world of you know, primarily cash transactions before the Bank Secrecy Act, but if they wanted, you know, if law enforcement wanted to search those records, um, they couldn't just directly do it. They couldn't just go to your office and rifle through your papers and find the papers relevant to your financial transactions because they think you're committing a crime. And the reason for that is because those records are in, uh, within this magic bubble, I'll call it, of your reasonable expectation of privacy. You know, we have a reasonable expectation in the US of privacy if we are keeping records in our home or on our person, say on a device, locally. <laughs> Um, it's unreasonable to think that, that we should have no privacy uh, with respect to those things. And this is, a, this is a judicial interpretation of the Fourth Amendment. When do you have protection against an unwarranted search, a search without a warrant? Well, you have protection when your records, the records that are being searched, are within this sort of sphere of your reasonable expectations of privacy. So what that means is not that law enforcement just can't get that data, it means we have a judicial process that's supposed to put a check on abuses of government power. You go and you go to a judge, and the judge either says, yes, I see your point, this person's been doing some very suspicious things, a search is warranted, here's your warrant, or no, I'm sorry, this is a fishing expedition, come back with uh, something more tangible and maybe I'll allow you to search their home. 
And that's the only way around this magic bubble of privacy that the Fourth Amendment affords us. But we don't live in that world anymore. We live, as was discussed at the end of the, my first talk, in a world where cash is disappearing. And in Scandinavia, there are situations where a person will go months without seeing or dealing in cash, because everything is now done using cards or other electronic payment mechanisms. And what that means, and I don't need to tell the people in this room, is if it's not cryptocurrency, it means that while there may still be some records held by individuals, these intermediaries have to have the records. Why? Because it is digital, it is electronic, and there's a double spending problem. So by necessity, Bank of America or PayPal or Venmo or any other centralized financial intermediary, they're going to have a record of transactions. And what's interesting about that from the constitutional law standpoint is, oh, they're no longer inside the magical bubble of reasonable expectations of privacy. They're outside with this other organization that because it's a corporation doesn't have the same sort of privacy rights. And they wouldn't represent our privacy rights anyway. It would be theirs, not ours. And you might say, well, but actually, I think I have a reasonable expectation of privacy over the records I keep with my bank. Those are private records. It's not like I'm just airing my full transaction history in the public square. But unfortunately, the Supreme Court has disagreed with you long ago in the 1970s. They basically said, no, you handed records off to a third party. And this is actually called the third party doctrine in the Fourth Amendment. And when you did that, you lost a reasonable expe expectation of privacy. This is basically akin to you going and shouting your social security number in a public space or handing it off to Equifax, as the case may be. You no longer can reasonably expect that information to stay private. And so you don't have a constitutional protection against warrantless searches any longer. And what that means is that law enforcement can just get a hold of those records directly without going through a judicial check like a judge. They can subpoena the company for information. They can technically, even in a constitutional way, just go to the company and ask them, hey, would you share this? And if the company agrees, the company agrees uh, in a less formal process. And so there's no judge involved. And indeed, uh, the legislatures can pass laws then that would still be constitutional that say, we shouldn't even have the direction going this way. The direction should go this way. So a financial institution, by virtue of the fact that they have to keep these records for their own purposes, and they take advantage of the laws of the United States, should therefore be obligated under legislation to just share data with law enforcement in real time, as it is relevant. And this is what financial institutions do. I went over some of the Bank Secrecy Act specifics in the previous talk. If it's a suspicious transaction, suspicion is not clearly defined, but if it's a suspicious transaction and it's over $2,000, the data just goes. And it goes into a giant database that FinCEN shares with law enforcement and also shares with state law enforcement, not just federal law enforcement. If it's a currency transaction report, which means there was a withdrawal of more than $10,000, the data just goes. No warrant, the data just goes. In fact, what's really going on here is not even a search, it's that Bank of America or PayPal or Venmo have been deputized by the US government to be part of the surveillance apparatus. They're almost like private law enforcement in a way. Now, I'm sorry to pick on Ethereum because Everything I'm about to say applies to all cryptocurrencies. I just like their logo. But <laughs> what happens now? What happens with cryptocurrency? Um, in many ways, we go back to this cash-like world. Um, so as we know, now there will be records kept by individual persons on their devices. And there will be records kept in the network, the blockchain, or on other nodes on the network. And, you know, we can do the same analysis. Uh, some of those records, like records that I have on my software wallet, if I have an Ethereum software wallet on my Android or something like that, those are within my reasonable uh, bubble of privacy expectations. Um, and those would be things like uh, the, the secret keys that relate to any balances that I have control of on the blockchain which is very useful information to law enforcement because that's proof positive that I'm actually related to those transactions, the beneficiary of those transactions. But I'm pretty sure if I'm running a software wallet, those are on my person. They're like my private papers. Uh, I, I think you need a warrant in order to get that information from an individual who has it. 
Now, the data that's public on the blockchain, so the, the list of valid transactions, that's public information. That's well outside of my reasonable expectation of privacy. And of course, the government can just go ahead and search that you know, at will without going through any judicial check or process. And that's what we see happening. But I think for my stuff, I think the judge still applies. Now, what if, however, we have a situation where there's not so many records on the blockchain that are of use to law enforcement anymore? Whether it's uh, zero knowledge proofs or ring signatures or mixing services, for whatever reason, the public data on the blockchain is no longer particularly useful to law enforcement, and most of the data that would be most useful is with individuals. In this world, we could posit a hypothetical, like what happens? And the reason why I go down this road is because we get asked this a lot. We get asked things like, well, Monero and Zcash, they're in big trouble, right? I'm like, that's kind of like Katie Hahn getting asked to, uh, to bring an enforcement action against Bitcoin. Like, is someone going to come for those networks? Who do they come for on those networks? What would they even ask? Would they just arrest people? What would they do? But people ask this all the time. They say, like, well, those guys are in trouble. What's going to happen? And I only bring this up because people ask this all the time. I have no indication from our meetings with people in the US government or elsewhere that there's a desire to do anything that I'm about to show you right here. But I want to dispel and work through the problems here. So the, the, the hypothetical might be, OK, so there's a, a protocol. And there's people developing the protocol. There's people developing wallet software for the protocol. If you could convince these people or force them to not eliminate the usefulness of public data, um, so not use ring signatures or zero knowledge proofs, you could stick, stay in the world where you have a lot of ability to do blockchain analysis. Or you could even force them to add code that would basically provide a, a, a black, uh, black door back door into the records kept on the network. Now, this is where, uh, and the reason why I would bring this up is because it brings up another um, constitutional argument or discussion to be had. This is where free speech actually comes in, rather than this being a discussion about the Fourth Amendment and privacy. This is now a discussion about the First Amendment and free speech. And that's because code, and I hesitate to say this with authority, because the case law is mushy. But code is, in many cases, speech. Source code, the academic literature surrounding source code, it can all be published in a book. It is often expressive. It expresses a political worldview, an idea about society. And in some cases, it's very tangible. Um, Justice Scalia, uh, now deceased, a former Supreme Court justice, known for being a bit of a, a conservative curmudgeon, however, didn't mince words. Even violent video game source code is speech, and therefore somewhat protected under the Constitution. You can't simply force the uh, manufacturers or creators of violent video game uh, source code to put labels on their video games that uh, are, are things that are not necessarily just statements of facts about the video game, like subjective statements, like this is a violent game, that sort of thing. This is what this case is about. Uh, but as a predicate to dealing with the labeling aspect and the compelled speech, because that's another aspect of free speech um, principles. You can't necessarily uh, put a prior restraint on someone's ability to speech, so stop them from publishing the violent video game if it's a speech act. And you can't force them, compel them to speak in a way that they were not already going to speak. Um, but before you get to the compelled speech argument, you have to reach this assumption or this legal uh, holding that the actual subject being expressed is speech. And that gets to the practicality of enforcement. At this point, it wouldn't necessarily be the development of the code that you'd be trying to stop or limit or put a restraint on. It would be the dissemination of the code within US borders, people's ability to run this on their local devices. And there you get to interesting distinctions between the difference between speaking and performing an action using software. And that's still a very vague and undefined area in the, in the law, because the law hasn't grappled with these issues very often in the speech context. But 
there are other cases that are even more directly relevant to us. So some of you may recognize this. This is RSA in Perl. Uh, it's unfortunately far too small to see or understand. But Adam Back actually printed these t-shirts for a while. Um, and this t-shirt is a munition. It's a uh, weapons technology. And for a time, the US said, you can't export weapons technology, and we classify this um, you know, military-grade encryption as weapons technology. So you can't uh, give this to a foreign national. You can't walk across a border with this technology. You're violating export control laws if you do that. And so it's kind of fun to think if we can print it, because it's just data, it's just an algorithm on a t-shirt, and then walk into Mexico with it, you are a munition, and you just violated federal law. And there was a case um, brought where um, uh, the guy's name was Daniel Bernstein. He was a cryptographer. He developed an uh, encryption system. I think it's called Snuffles. I don't know much about it. Maybe some of you do. Um, and he published this source code, and he published an academic work describing how to use the source code to achieve encryption uh, and an encryption system. And he was uh, disseminating it openly on the internet um, to foreign nationals. And he basically, he was charged with violating export control laws. And what had to be found and, and delist speech? And the answer was yes. Now, unfortunately, there's a subsequent case um, that revoked that opinion. So this is actually not totally solid law. But it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't overrule that opinion, it just revoked it. So still sort of on the fence here, but very interesting. Um, and finally, and this is very relevant to our space, um, very relevant, this is the bad news. This case, United States versus Mendelssohn, is about uh, bookmaking software for gambling. So for people who would run a little shop where they'd you know, put a horse race on the television and take bets uh, illegally. Uh, you want to use computers now, because they're great, to keep track of the bets and the odds and who owes who what, you can buy a software product for that. And back then it was a, a CD, because this was before the internet, and that's how you distribute software. A company developed a software product that helped the bookie keep the books and was trafficking in it, according to prosecution, in interstate commerce. And they were said to be trafficking in gambling paraphernalia. Um, they just developed the software. They weren't running uh, gambling pools or anything like that. And the argument was made, uh, like in the previous slides, well, this is speech. This is something that you can't put a prior restraint on my ability to speak unless you first prove that you have a highly compelling government interest and the law that uh, achieves that interest is narrowly tailored. But the court didn't agree with that in this case. They said that, no, this software program it has no expressive or political or other qualities to it that are not illegal acts. The expression has merged with the illegal act. They are one in the same, and so this is not protected speech for the purposes of the First Amendment. And there's some interesting features about the software that maybe helped them reach that decision. There was a particular key combination that you could press on your terminal that was running the software that would make the screen go black and erase all the records. And the only reason for that is because you're worried about a raid, and you want to take the computer system down so when the cop shows up, you're just a bunch of guys playing solitaire. So this is the bad news. And this area is very gray. Now, aside from the compelled speech argument and whether someone developing computer source code um, is really doing a speech act and whether they could be compelled to put back doors in and whether somebody who wanted to use software developed overseas is able to disseminate that within the US, all those arguments aside, what about this broader question of what happens when we lose the public information, when we lose Bank of America and all its aggregation? I actually don't think we're in such a terrible world at that point. Um, remember, that's the world that existed before uh, electronic banking, before most of our transactions ended up happening using credit cards and debit cards. Um, and so, you know, judges can potentially still get a hold of records from law-abiding citizens uh, or law enforcement through judges uh, using uh, warranted searches. We don't have bulk collection, but we can still have uh, reasonable access to records through normal judicial processes. And to the extent there are still exchanges, um, systems like Zcash are actually, I think, pretty great, uh, full disclosure, member of the foundation, 
because the exchange can operate in two ways. It can run only tra uh, transparent address transactions, in which case their records are now becoming more public, and they can uh, get those public records without a warrant. Or if they are served with a warrant uh, or a subpoena, um, because they are a third party, if they're holding people's Zcash for them, people aren't holding it directly, um, they can provide the view keys to unblind shielded transactions. They can do selective disclosure, take advantage of that, and still give law enforcement verifiable records of transactions that may or may not be related to crime, um, and do it when proper service has been um, served to them. So with that, I'm going to go uh, briefly into consumer protection now. Now, the rationale for consumer protection regulation is different than the rationale for financial surveillance regulation. Um, the rationale is that centralized systems are prone to getting hacked, going down, mismanaging money, uh, all these sorts of things. And we saw this happen at Mt. Gox. Um, in 2014, they lost $600 million. Uh, that, that figure is not even accurate anymore, given the new exchange rates, of course. Um, and of course, we see it in the traditional financial space. Um, and this is why we say that you can't just be a bank by you know, putting up a sign. You have to get an official charter from the government. You have to be regulated for prudential purposes. And what does this mean? Um, in our space, it means this. Some companies, like centralized uh, companies in the regulated financial space, are in this similar position of trust with respect to their customers. They hold valuables for them, and therefore they are at risk of hacking or mismanagement or things like that. The uh, CSBS, which is the Conference of State Bank Supervisors, which is the sort of meta-organization of state regulators in the US, has agreed with this interpretation that the thing that gives rise to the need for prudential regulation, consumer protection regulation, like money transmission licensing, is this third-party control of virtual currency. I have it. I'm holding it for third parties. I can lose it. So maybe I should be regulated not dissimilarly to how a bank or a money transmitter is regulated. Financial surveillance aside, just to make sure that I don't mismanage or lose the funds. Now, that all sounds very reasonable, right? What's unreasonable about that in the US is the fact that if you're not a bank, if you're not doing fractional reserve lending, deposit taking and lending, there's no way to get a single national license or charter. If you're a bank, you can go to the OCC and get a charter. But if you're just a money services business, just someone who's a custodian or just transmitting, you have to go to 53 different states and territories and get a license in every state where you have customers. And that's a difficult process, a really complicated process, and it's um, aggravated by the fact that every state has a different definition of what constitutes money transmission. And in every state, that definition is more or less amenable to being interpreted as including various different virtual currency or, or cryptocurrency activities. So maybe a fully custodial exchange clearly fits within the definition of one state, but doesn't actually in the definition of another state. Or maybe uh, even something like a multi-sig provider or a node on a payment channel technically fits into the definition in one state, because in some states the definition of money transmission is as vague as facilitating the transmission of money which is not a good way to write a legal definition, but there are a lot of states with a lot of different definitions. So this is actually the back end of um, what we call our state regulatory tracker on Coin Center's website. The front end is a nice interactive map with um, the ability to click on a state and learn a bunch of data. This is, I want to show you this because this is what I have to deal with to actually keep it updated, and these are the URLs to all the various state statutes on various websites that are pretty uh, poorly maintained. Um, and you know, this is all an aside for you and the international community because actually the situation is much better in most other countries. This is one area where the US is extremely backwards and not because of bad intentions or, you know, silliness, just because of the structure of federalism in our country. We used to have all these state regulators and they all apply their laws extraterritorially to other states. So the reason why I bring this up is because we've been working with an organization in the US, the Uniform Law Commission, which its sole purpose is to create uniformity across all these different states, to make sure that you know, if you have a commercial contract with a merchant and they're in South Carolina and you're in South Dakota, that the same law applies to both of you. Their main work product is the Uniform Commercial Code, which has been adopted all over the US, of course. 
They're now working on a uniform regulation of Virtual Currency Businesses Act, which I think is a good idea, because if we're going to have state regulation, we could at least get all the states to say the same thing. And the thing that's most important to get all the states together on is who needs a license and who doesn't need a license. Because for the people who shouldn't be licensed, it's a, it's a minefield. You think, oh, I'm not a custodial business. I'm a miner. I'm a full node, a node on a payment channel network, a multi-sig wallet provider who has one of three keys. I'm not a money transmitter. Yeah, but every state has a different definition, and you might fit into one of them. So how can we get all the states to have the same definition so it's not a minefield, and hopefully the right definition so we don't slap permissions on the ability to participate on these non-custodial activities? Because it's kind of it's game over, at least as far as these things being legal activities, these networks being, being viable, if in order to run a full node, or, or in order to mine, or make a proof of stake, or, or be a node on the Lightning Network, you need to first get permission from 53 state regulators. Uh, it's just nobody will do those activities anymore, and without people doing that, the network doesn't exist. And these are not the kinds of activities that justify that kind of heavy-duty regulation. The activities that justify that kind of heavy-duty regulation are holding a bunch of money for people and putting it in jeopardy, like Mt. Gox does. So we've worked with them over the last two years, and I'm proud to report that this Model Act has finally been approved and finalized by the Uniform Law Commission. It's there and available for states to adopt. And I bring this up because to the extent Israel or the EU nations or any other country in the world are thinking about how do we define the set of businesses that we want to put prudential regulations on, this is, I think, the best definition you can come up with and should be the one that doesn't just end up in all the states but ends up international. And it focuses on control. So the only companies that are licensed under this Model Act, and that I think should ever be licensed in a prudential regulatory scheme, are companies that have control of virtual currency or cryptocurrency on behalf of other per persons. And the best thing about the ULC is that they were happy to work with us to find a definition of control, so then that's not just le left up to the imagination or to an imaginative prosecutor uh, who's prosecuting someone for unlicensed money transmission. And the definition is this. It's a relation, in relation to a transaction uh, involving virtual currency, it's the power to execute unilaterally or prevent indefinitely a virtual currency transaction. So a one of three in a multi-sig like BitGo provides. You cannot unilaterally execute a transaction. Can you indefinitely prevent the user from transacting? No. You go offline, you disappear, you get hacked. The worst case scenario is the guy whose wallet you were running has to go dig up their backup key or go to the other person who has it. Now, are there consumer protection issues with someone who's providing a multi-sig wallet? Of course, but they're not the kind of consumer protection issues that we regulate through heavy-duty prudential regulation. They're the kind of consumer protection issues we regulate through unfair and deceptive acts and practices, uh, through ex-post uh, ex regulation, not ex-ante permission-based regulation. And then the one other thing I want to highlight, this also wouldn't apply to a, a Lightning Network node, because while you may be in a one of two, you can't indefinitely um, prevent the, the money from moving because there should be a time lock uh, on, on your control. It should flow back if the payment channel gets interrupted, excluded. I think this is a tight definition, and I think it's the right one to identify who really provides that kind of risk that warrants prudential regulation. The other thing that's very important is that persons who are acting on their own behalf, recall our discussion of you're not Eve between Alice and Bob, you are Alice or you are Bob. Persons acting on their own behalf should never be regulated for prudential purposes because they're also not in a position of trust. They're acting in their own interests, not on behalf of the interests of others. And so the ULC has this excellent exemption, one of several. Um, exempted from regulation is any person using virtual currency solely on its own behalf for personal, family, or household purposes or for academic purposes. And using includes creating, investing, buying, selling, or obtaining virtual currency as payment for the purchase of sale of goods. And creating is kind of interesting here because this would even potentially apply to someone who's inventing or developing a new cryptocurrency you know, for their own purposes or a new token for their own purposes. So I think these are really like excellent statements of how we would want consumer protection laws to evolve with respect to prudential regulation, permission-based regulation. I think the ULC has done an excellent job, 
and I'm happy to share this work internationally such that if uh, prudential regulators at the federal level of various states are interested in finding a way to identify who should be regulated, that there is this material available to them. Because, as I said, the most important issue to Coin Center is that non-custodial activities being you know, performed on the network, mining, proofs of stake, things like that, that they not be swept into a permission-based regulatory regime, because that would put massive impediments uh, in front of the technology and its, and its development. I don't think it could stop it. Probably not, because how would you enforce that? But it could delay it uh, quite seriously and end up with a lot of innocent and innovative people potentially behind bars. Thanks.